Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. We had a question from our viewer, Stephen Daly. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Thank you, Stephen, which is asking if I could please make a video about tiebreaker rules. So this is a somewhat boring, but yet important conversation. So we're gonna dive in today to tiebreaker rules in treaties, how they work, where they apply, etc. So let's talk about it right now. Before we do, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the all notification bell. If you'd like help with international tax optimization, paying the lowest legal amount of tax possible, setting up an international business structure for yourself, relocating abroad, getting residencies and citizenships, etc., please reach out to us. You can book a call with me, calendly.com forward slash Michael dash Rosmer. There's a link in the description below. And you can also send a message to our websites, offshorecitizen.net or offshorecapitalist.com, also links below. Okay. So uh, for context on tiebreaker rules, this applies to tax treaties, and the worthwhile starting point to realize is that international law trumps domestic law, okay? So when a country has agreed to a treaty between countries, essentially what they are saying is that uh, those rules kind of surpass their own rules. And I remember when I first heard of this concept, it was actually uh, years and years ago when I was in grade school, I think grade eight or something like that, uh, somewhere between grade seven and 10, anyway. And we were studying Japan and talking about how foreign diplomats got to use foreign laws in Japan. This was back, you know, in like after, uh, whatever his name was, Matthew Perry, I believe it was, sailed into Japan and was the kind of end of the Tokugawa era and the start of the Meiji period. And so this was like crazy to me, right? <laughs> like, how can this happen? And Obviously today we still have uh, diplomats having diplomatic immunity. Doesn't entirely mean that there's no consequences because they'll often get deported and things like this, but they can definitely get away with a lot of things. And, you know, I just thought, what a nuts situation. But uh, international laws are a little bit like this. And there's some examples such as if we're looking for the Hague Convention on the Recognition of Trust and their applicability. It was a multi-party convention that was signed and that's an example of where foreign countries agreed to recognize, or given countries agreed to recognize the trust laws of foreign countries when the trust would come and operate in their jurisdiction. There's some practical reasons for that. Likewise, when we're talking about tax treaties, it's all about you know who gets to tax what income, and there's inherently going to be conflicts. And so the countries have basically agreed to have this in the event that there's a conflict to have this. Uh, set of law override their domestic law. And that's really powerful, right? Really, really powerful. So sometimes when we're doing international tax planning, we need to look at tax treaties. Now, a lot of people kind of exaggerate the effects of tax treaties. They'll often kind of think it's some sort of a get out of jail card or that they won't necessarily be double taxed or if they're taxed, if they pay tax in this country, they don't have to pay tax in that country. And a bunch of these are mistaken notions. Also, in most cases, when we're designing structures, we're trying to avoid having to use tax treaties at all. However, there are some cases where, due to the nature of what's going on, you must deal with two countries. And the most common of these is when we're talking about residency clauses. And so this is typically Article 4 in a tax treaty. And what does this mean? Well, I've done a bunch of videos in the past about how tax residency is a concept which essentially means that uh, somebody's uh, particular jurisdiction's tax rules apply. All right, so you're in a situation where you're tax resident in Canada, that means the Canadian tax rules apply. If you're tax resident in Argentina, it means the Argentinian tax rules apply. If you're tax resident in Georgia, it means the Georgian tax residency rules can apply. And you can be in a situation where because of uh, the way that the rules work in both countries, you might be tax resident in both. And a double tax agreement, as we call it, which is one of the two main types of tax treaties, the other being a tax information exchange agreement, is designed to prevent uh, double taxation, right? Literally, that's in the name. So how does that work? Well, what they say is, in the event that you're considered a resident of both jurisdictions, we will apply this criteria to determine which one you are, and we're going to separate it from one to the other. And this is for individuals we're starting with here. So there's usually four criteria. The first criteria is to say that we are going to deem that you are a resident of the country in which you have a permanent home available to you. If you have a, and so 
if you have a permanent home in one but not the other, then you're tax resident in that country but not the other country. Very useful, right? In theory, you can cross over the rules in this country and still might not be taxable if under the tax treaty you're tax resident in this one and you have a permanent home here but not here. Very interesting. Number two, uh, if you have a home in both countries or in neither country, then we're typically going to look and say, uh, where do you have uh, your, what we would call habitual abode, okay? Uh, I might have this wrong in terms of the order. This might be two and three. Anyway, not really so important. The whole point is, what does habitual abode mean? Habitual abode, I think I've done a video on this in the past, is where you kind of habitually return to as you're kind of doing your global trotting, right? Uh, the third one is where your center of vital interests are located. Okay, so, uh, and so this is kind of your, where is your center of life? You know, where do you live? Where do you have family? Where do you have your ties? What, you know, that sort of thing. And in each of these, if they say, if it's in one or neither, or it cannot be determined, we're going on to the next one. And so then usually what will happen is uh, you may have a fourth one and sometimes in that fourth one it's you know if we can't figure these out then by mutual consent of the uh, authorities we'll decide but very often it would be uh, where you're a national and if you're not a national of either country then or you're a national of both countries then it will come by mutual agreement of the competent authorities in each country and if the competent authorities can't agree then you will not get the benefits of that, this tax treaty that's basically what it says and the same principle can apply. Usually you would have a clause for companies. So you would say, okay, in the event that a company is resident of both jurisdictions, then which one would it be? And it will usually go in one of three categories. There's not like this complex set of checks one after the other. In the case of companies, it's usually either the place of management and control or the place of registration for the company or where the competent authorities decide. We always hate when it's competent authorities decide because we have no idea which way that will go, right? Uh, unless you're talking about, say, you know, some small country negotiating with the US, in which case it's pretty much always going the way the US wants. So that's, uh, that's the deal there. And then you can sometimes have it where it applies also to trusts or other types of entities, just depending on the treaty. So yeah, what would happen in that case? What would happen is it probably is not gonna come up unless I end up say in tax court or something like that but in the event that there was some sort of a dispute because of course my country will assume and, we, and I could be a member of both countries so it could be my country could be both countries right is going to assume that I'm tax resident in theirs unless kind of uh, demonstrated otherwise by the treaty so I would have to prove to them that under the treaty terms I didn't meet that standard they might disagree and then we would kind of go down and obviously eventually it could get to this competent authorities uh, determination. So what that would mean is you would end up in a situation where the tax rules would apply in one place but not the other place and hopefully that would fall on the side that was useful and good for you. So I hope it helps. If you have any questions put them in the comments below. I will look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.